Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the second installment of Business as Usual. My name is Joanna, and together with Amandeep, um, we will be hosting this conversation as part of the Young Trustees series, Business as Usual, where we focus on architecture, activism, and how young practitioners can push for change. There is a long history of architectural groups exploring and campaigning for change in their work, and notably in times of social difficulty, which we see um, now as being. In the context of the pandemic, as everyone's <laughs> aware, our daily routines have been suspended, and we believe that this makes it an opportune time to dwell into change in architecture and architects driving change. And behind this conversation is our opinion that architects can no longer be silent on how our models for practice often perpetuate unfairness in terms of work and welfare, as in our previous conversation, ecology, which we will talk today, um, diversity coming up, and many others. I see the context of our work as an intersection of injustices. And whilst in the past years, we have seen the emergence of several initiatives and working groups looking to push the profession towards sustainability, I think work, uh, very good work has already been done. And I will mention a few that have, been, that have sat closer to home. ACAN, the Architects Climate Action Network, has been campaigning for decarbonization, ecological regeneration, and cultural transformation in the built environment. Architecture Education Declares and the Anthropocene Architecture School have been pushing for curriculum change. And um, the London Energy Transformation Initiative has published a very urgent climate emergency design guide, as well as the embodied carbon primer. Uh, and they are just some of many, and I believe we're going to hear about a lot of different ways of pushing for change today. I'm very excited to host this conversation on emerging frameworks for climate action. Um, and I will also try to probe how they intersect with systems of oppression. And this is to say that we cannot deal with the climate crisis in isolation from other social issues. Um, I also want to add that I'm aware that I'm hosting this conversation from a place of significant privilege and see a lot of work ahead. Also, the fact that there isn't a black voice on this panel is part of the problem. There is a lot more learning and active work that um, myself as an individual and us in a, as an organization need to do. And uh, here I want to paraphrase from Dr. Ayanna Johnson in her brilliant op-ed. She says that we need to do this because black and brown people are disproportionately affected by climate impacts, whilst also being significantly more concerned about climate change than white people. And also because the magnitude of the climate crisis demands all of us at the table. And until racial equity is the norm, truly sustainable practice will not be attained. Um, and also, I'm aware that very often the contributions of people of color are erased from environmental discourse. And so I want to use this short bit of time that I get to introduce this conversation to foreground a couple of key thinkers, activists, and makers who are pushing for structural sustainability. Uh, firstly, um, Dr. Ariana Elizabeth Johnson is a marine biologist, policy expert, writer, and Brooklyn native. She's a founder and CEO of Ocean Collective and of Urban Ocean Lab, as well as a professor in the Department of Environmental Studies at New York University. And she's the author of the brilliant Washington Post op-ed, paraphrased previously on the need to address racial injustice, to allow people of color to do the climate work we all need to do. Secondly, Julian Ajiman is a professor of urban and environmental policy and planning at Tufts University and co-founder of Local Environment, the International jo Journal of Justice and Sustainability. They're all really brilliant resources and we're gonna share these and more um, after the conversation. Uh, and I mentioned him because he's the originator of the concept of just sustainabilities, the international and he defines that as the intentional integration of social justice and sustainability 
defined as the need to ensure a better quality of life for all now and into the future in a just and equitable manner while living within the limits of supporting ecosystems. I think this idea of justice within, uh, within the limits of ecosystems is really, really important. Then um, I want to mention Maya Rose Craig uh, in Britain. She has created the nonprofit organization Black to Nature, who run nature camps for black and minority ethnic children. And she received an honorary doctorate in science from the University of Bristol for that initiative. And in, and in recognition for her advocacy for visible minority ethnic children and teenagers. And her work is really interesting because she frames nature and environmental knowledge in relatable ways, particularly to address the fact that this proportionate number of minority ethnic young people live in inner cities and are excluded from ecological experiences. Um, and then finally, uh, I want to mention Leah Penniman, a farmer, educator, author, and food sovereignty activist. She is co-founder and co-director and program manager of Soul Fire Farm in Grafton, New York, and the author of Farming While Black. She has been tending to the soil for 20 years and organizing for an anti-racist food system for 15 years. So her work really tackles both. And um, they are, of course, not the only ones. Uh, the list is long and should be growing. So we will share ours. Um, and please also share your list in the chat or afterwards. Um, so I will now open the conversation with our speakers and we'll ask them to talk briefly about their work in the context of climate action. First, I would like to introduce Sital Solanki, a translator of materials and the founder and director of Matter. She is the author of Why Materials Matter and the textile tutor at the RCA. So Sital, you can take the mic. Great. Uh, thanks for having me this evening. Um, so maybe I can just introduce my practice a little bit. And so Matter is a relational practice and it's focused on building and bridging kinships between ourselves, materials, the immaterial and virtual. And that is very inclusive of other beings. And so we help to reorient mindsets, behaviors and mechanisms towards futures that are caring and respectful. And that's in order to sort of provide an ecological and nuanced uh, nuanced strategies that are inclusive, also biodiverse and responsible. So I'm also based in London. I've been working, uh, I've had my practice for about five years this coming September and I've been teaching for many years. So I kind of bridge between academia and industry and all the in between and work across pretty much every single discipline you can imagine because materials are a conduit to everything. Um, I just wanted to use this background actually, um, this virtual background. So it's an artist called Lorenzo Vittori and he's been documenting lots of different landscapes materially across um, different parts of Africa and even Ridley Road Market in Dolston. And the rich diverse nature of materials that he's captured provides some sort of um, aspect on how informal ways of you know working with materials are actually equally as valuable as formal ones so that's the reason for my background uh, thanks Sito. next up it's Kat Scott she's a senior architecture assistant at DRMM and part of the Architects Declare steering group she plays an active role in three of the architecture profession's leading climate advocacy group, um, Architects Declare, Letty and Akan, where I've met Kat on the Where the Wild Things Are, or in the Where the Wild Things Are working group. Um, so Kat, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, I suppose 
I thought I'd give a really brief um, introduction to the groups that you've mentioned, um, as well as myself. Um, I suppose, firstly, I wanted to just say thank you for asking me to contribute today. It's really exciting to be part of um, this wide ranging panel. Um, and I suppose each of the three groups that you've mentioned have a distinctive identity and role and theory for how to affect change inside and beyond the architecture profession. Um, I can't personally profess to have been part of climate advocacy for very long, um, or at least not as much um, as I have been in the last year. Um, but I think a lot of us are in a position where over the last couple of years we felt um, that we've realised that the government and um, politicians just aren't doing enough, um, that the systems we operate in are flawed and that we can do more as a kind of group of um, individuals coming together in collective groups um, in order to affect change. And I think there's been a really radical shift in the architecture profession um, in terms of the impact that we have as professionals on the planet. And that's how um, I suppose I've been drawn to join these groups. Um, and also the social injustices arriving from construction. Um, I suppose each of the groups that I'm part of um, respond to the kind of complicated situation of the climate biodiversity and climate injustices um, in their own way. Um, my personal interests lie most specifically in carbon and um, resource depletion and the ecological aspects of the climate and biodiversity emergency. Um, so my background is my back garden, um, which is my kind of refuge at the moment. Um, I feel like Letty, um, Letty is a network of professionals that come together to affect change through knowledge sharing and using their professional expertise. It's very interdisciplinary and um, I suppose through, through that I've learned a lot about working in collaboration with others. Um, ACAN is a bit more of a personal endeavour for me. Um, it's the role that I have that I don't really do during working hours. Um, takes a lot of my evenings and weekends. Um, and it's about individuals and um, tries to be inclusive and um, say that regardless of what you're working on in your daily life or what you do for work even, um, that you're very welcome to come and help affect change. Um, and like you said, I'm a coordinator for the Where the Wild Things Aren't group. Um, we specifically work on the kind of ecological regeneration part of ACAN's activities. Um, and then Architects to Care, I'm involved in on two levels because I work for a practice that is trying to meet the Architects to Care um, commitments. Um, so I have the daily battle of trying to affect change from a project level and from an internal um, perspective. Um, and then I'm also involved in the steering group, as you mentioned, so trying to shape and help facilitate the bigger picture of how we affect system change. Um, and I'm involved in kind of day-to-day -day kind of activities, things like analysing the survey that we've just sent out to our signatories, um, and then this week um, helping to develop our statement on anti-racism and climate justice and solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Um, I find it really hard to summarise these groups, um, so I'm sure we can talk about them more. Um, but I think what I wanted to say is that they all share a lot of commonalities, that they are possible because of people and companies giving their support in time and kind. Um, they're all trying to be as inclusive as and as interdisciplinary as they can be, but I think there's a lot more that they could be doing in that respect. And I know they're all working to do better in that regard. Um, and so I think for anyone who's feeling that they want to get involved in climate advocacy and volunteering, I'd say just do it. Um, it's a really great learning experience and helps to give a really good sense of purpose, um, which is really um, comforting, particularly in this very weird time. Um, so yeah, thank you. Amazing. It's such a it's such a good way to end your introduction. I feel like I need to go do things now, but um, I guess I'll continue with this. Um, so the third speaker is Julian Saravo. He heads Autonomy Urban with a focus on aging populations and the future of care, logistics, and workspace. And he's also part of Commonwealth, where he's busy turning green policy into design questions. Julian, if you want to take the stage. Sorry, I'm Julian. <laughs> I'm Julian. As Joanna said, I, I work at two different think tanks. Um, and probably throughout the talk, I'm going to sort of wear both hats because a lot of the work overlaps. Um, 
I I brought I brought this image which is which is a, a, a tabloid. It's called the Daily Star, uh, and it was it was actually one of our proudest moments um, in the think tank in autonomy um, because to me it represents hegemony and uh, the idea that you can get some. Uh, you you can work towards getting ideas that sounded uh, wacky until the day before yesterday, sort of into the public discourse and sort of closer and closer uh, to people's imaginary. Um, I don't know if you can read it. It says, work a nine hour week to save the planet. Um, <laughs> and this was a report we put out uh, a few months back called The Ecological Limits of Work. Uh, and basically a, um, a researcher crunched the numbers and an energy engineer and he worked out that basically at current at the current pace we could only work nine hours of the week um, to achieve our climate goals um, and we got it into into the tabloid because a couple of weeks earlier we got the contact for somebody from Associated Press um, which was a sort of step up from our contacts in the Guardian or other sort of more friendly places, uh, because it means that 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 then a tabloid can sort of run with it in 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 whichever way <laughs> um, that uh, that they do. So so uh, this sort of answers. Uh, we were asked to sort of think about how we measure success, um, and I think yeah this. This image represents both that and and sort of all the all the weird ways in which um, in which uh, I feel like we can affect change. Um, I just just a few words about about my role in these think tanks. I've um, I've actually just recently left school, the RCA, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a couple of years ago, <laughs> um, and. I sort of entered into this weird world of, of young think tanks, um, almost sort of small startups uh, who want to sort of do things in a different way and bring in uh, different voices. And um, I've been spending the past year and a half working out ways in which architects can be useful to these groups. Um, and to really sort of shape narratives in ways that they haven't done so far. The image behind me is a sort of pretty traditional uh, way in which think tanks um, try to sort of uh, shape the public discourse. Um, if I <laughs> if I can if I can change my virtual background, uh, this is there, there we go. This is um, this is a project I've I've been working on with. Commonwealth uh, called the Green New Deal City of 2030. Um, so it's really uh, what we're trying to do is work out how we can create a structured narrative around very big, often boring policy and explain sort of what it will mean both to architects and to people who, who will be living um, in the neighborhoods that need to change. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Julian. And as a last bit of information that I want to put out there before um, you all take the floor and before we include the people in, this, uh, in the chat as well, um, in light of the very strategic and um, large scale activist direct action that is happening in the world. Um, I also wanted to revisit the case of Tom Bennett, who was arrested at a very different protest, um, at an Extinction Rebellion protest a couple of years back. And when faced with potential disciplinary action from the ARB, the Architects Registration Board, he argued that his action was not in contravention of point nine, which is uh, to maintain the reputation of architects with a capital A but rather a natural extension of point 0.5 from the code of conduct, which is considered the wider impact of your work and the duty towards the public interest. Uh, and here is where I'd like to open it up um, to speakers. How do you see 
uh, individual and institutional and or institutional duties towards public interest and how does it translate into what you do and whoever wants to go first please do I can also name names. But. <laughs> I'm sorry, Joanna, could you, would you mind repeating the question? I, I'm, I'm, you have to so forgive how me. Do you, um, how do you see both your duties to, towards the public interest as an individual and uh, how, how do you think that institutions might think about um, their duties towards public interest? Um, and I think it would be great if you know, you can address how this translates into what you do and into the kind of tangible spaces that you occupy when you work. And I, I guess you can go first. <laughs> uh, um, so I think, um, it's just sort of, it's a very, personal note, but it's the first time I feel useful um, in my life, which is, which is, which is really nice. Um, and it's, and it's, um, this, this comes after sort of years and years, I mean, <laughs> I, I uh, this is going to come out the wrong way. Um, I, I've spent a lot of years uh, since high school in a lot of, um, in, a, in a lot of grassroots movements and that so I don't mean that those aren't effective. I I mean I've I've never been as effective in those as I am in in this kind of organization. So I think it's about recognizing what your skill is and and what nodes uh, in the system that you want to change you can access and you have the tools to access. Um, and and I bring all that experience with me. Um, but I've, I've, I felt recently that, that, um, um, with a very guided, um, set of aims, uh, I, I, I ask myself less questions about what my role within it all is because, um, it, it's, it's, um, a lot of the work coincides with it um, and it's a feeling that that's yeah it's I I, I wish it upon everybody Sita <laughs> um, would you like to yeah sure um, well I can speak about it from a perspective of me personally uh, from one angle I think um, I guess I've always been fighting for the minority in some way. And that can mean from lots of different perspectives, not just because I'm colored, but also female. And um, also because I'm a textile designer by training. So as a textile designer, I have been kind of anonymous, should I say, or like, I have had no place of belonging because we're just this kind of conduit that sort of floats around between lots of different industries and doesn't re we don't really have a place where we belong. And really, my practice has been built on out of frustration um, due to the lack of respect for materials across every single industry I've worked in. And that has been like over a 12, 13 year period before I even launched my practice. So this idea of equality or justice or, you know, the, the idea of judgment even is, is kind of a really big catalyst for me. Um, I would kind of place myself as a bit of a rebel, um, not just, I'm also a middle child, so that also probably helps frame that context as well and I think this idea of not being not belonging anywhere has really shaped a lot of what I do 
um, on a personal and also a professional level because I think I've been fighting something that has been misunderstood, misrepresented and also disrespected as well. So materials have kind of um, been misused uh, uh, a lot of the time and I wanted to create a place where they would at least have more awareness been paid to them because materials have kind of existed in academia and sciences for such a long time and they they're experts like expertise basically people that are working with it will have more awareness about them but when you really start to sort of dig a bit deeper um, materials is something that actually everybody uses on a daily basis and all of the time so we're never without materials and I think like sort of bringing that sort of conversation to a wider uh, wider pool of people uh, for public interest as well as personal interest I think um, not and also professional interest I think everybody should use materials understand materials to some degree uh, not necessarily the levels of which that I might know them or somebody else working with them should or, or knows them so I think a lot of it is about language and how we frame that and how we can somehow change the narrative around what um, making it more relatable and also accessible for people so a lot of my work is framed around that so that's why i kind of describe my practice as a relational one so that it becomes like materials become more relatable for others to understand to engage with to apply to find some sort of connection to and i think a lot of where we're at right now is trying to think about almost diminishing the human ego a little bit and um, less anthropocentric and more planet centric and my practice is very much about doing that so it's not just for public but it's also for the planet so it's trying to have a more collective spirit or at least one that's aligned with other beings um, to inform more responsible ways of working and knowing and um, that is definitely for public interest but it's also beyond that I would say um, I hope that kind of answers your question yeah that's great um, yeah. would you like to step in yeah so um, I guess I know Tom Bennett quite well through ACAN um, and I think his case in particular has raised it an awful lot of questions in terms of what being professional in architecture should be in a climate emergency and how professional codes of conduct might need to change and or whether it even matters if you call yourself an architect anymore um, and this is partly why ACAN led a campaign and has actively tried to engage with the RIBA and the ARB on exactly this um, but I speak as someone who is still at this stage completely unqualified, um, uh, although hopefully not for much longer. And as yet, I'm therefore not constrained by any professional code of conduct, I suppose only my employment contract. Um, but I, as a personality, find it really hard to do things outside of normal conventions. I, I'd say, unlike CTAL, I am not a rebel. Um, I'm quite rule abiding and I find that, um, I find it quite difficult and quite uncomfortable taking direct action and being a participant in that. Um, but with that being said, um, one of the most incredible days of my life was probably the Global Climate Strike Day last year, um, because it felt like a really real turning point and moment within the profession to see so many architects and engineers turning out to go march to Millibank together. And um, it was a really brilliant feeling that day. Um, and also just that um, we invited speakers and we made quite a lot of that day um, as an office as well which was really special um, but in general yeah I think personally I find that I'm more comfortable doing kind of desk based um, activism um, and staying quite close to my day job and trying to translate my normal working skills into something that is use useful for climate advocacy and um, so I think that's why for example Letty feels like a really comfortable place for me and um, because it, it is 
um, doing things that we do within our jobs anyway, research, drawing diagrams, writing um, text descriptions of research that we pull together, um, but translating it in a way that's knowledge sharing and it's not just for internal uses. Um, so yeah, that's my personal, that's my personal um, kind of approach to these things. But I think that's what's really important is to find what you're comfortable with as an individual and, and to kind of own that and not feel worried about that not being good enough or um, not being the right thing. Because I think we need help on all fronts at this present time, whether that's going to actively go protest or whether it's signing petitions online. I think there's so much that can be done um, for all different personalities. Um, and I think that's what's really special. Um, and something that's really positive and hopefully makes it easier for these groups to be more accessible to a wider range of people. Can I also add to that actually? Because um, I think there's also something to be said about um, learning through discomfort, well, learning through discomfort, because I think we're in a place of discomfort and we have been for some time and it's heightened right now. And I think a lot of that needs to sort of shift in terms of like, I mean, I feel like an imposter in lots of different situations. So I definitely suffer from imposter syndrome, but it doesn't paralyze me or debilitate me to an extent that I can't do my work, but it drives me to actually learn more about what I do or what others do um, and sort of engage with something that I'm perhaps unfamiliar with. And I think there's so much to be said about that, I think, because I think a lot of change can come from feeling uncomfortable, actually. And we start to perhaps recalibrate or realign somehow. I think there's a lot of people are going through a rewiring process and a recalibration process right now. And that's because we are very uncomfortable right now. So I think change has to definitely come from some place of discomfort as well as comfort. I don't think it um, works either way or in extremes. It's, it's much, much more about like the balance of the two. So yeah, so just adding to that really. Yeah, I completely agree. I feel uncomfortable a lot of the time, even doing the more kind of death-based activism. You know, you're constantly questioning, why am I doing this? Or am I really the right person to be saying this? Do I have enough experience? And you doubt yourself a lot. And I think it's important to try to fight those um, inner gremlins <laughs> and try to have confidence that um, at least you're saying it and at least you're doing it. And even if you say slightly the wrong thing, hopefully the general message comes across. Yeah, and I think it's the point of sharing, really, because I think if you're not fully aware of something or you have little awareness of something, you can actually ask for help in that sense. And like, it becomes more collaborative and a more shared experience rather than it being something that um, you're working in isolation, perhaps. Um, sorry for the bad term, but yes. I think it's more about a collective spirit um, these days and a shared one. Yeah, I think this is um, what you're saying ties really well into the question that um, I was going to ask. And I will ask this question, but I also encourage everyone to share any thoughts or any questions in the chat. And um, you can either read them out loud or we can, we can um, ask the speakers on your behalf if you prefer. But um, the other bits that I wanted uh, to throw out is with this idea of allies and what relationship you've had to forge, but then also, and in relationship to that, um, Canon, uh, where do you learn from and where do you look for trick, both triggers and models for um, the change that you're pushing for? Um, yeah, Kat, maybe you want to start with this one? Yeah, so I suppose in terms of allies, um, I feel like I've fostered so many friendships out of working as part of these groups and part of me becoming involved in some of them has been as a result of friends dragging me along to meetings. And I think friendships and allyships are a really important part of this. I think um, once you start reading up on climate crises, it's quite depressing and there's, you know, it's constantly getting worse, the news. And... Um, 
it can be quite overwhelming. So it's really important to have a strong network of people that you can talk to and feel positive that you're doing something with. And so I think that's really important. But also what I'd say is it's a lot of the time for me, at least a lot of the same faces cropping up in these circles. So um, people wearing different hats. Um, and that's really nice because it's, I'd say it's quite a close network of people who turn up to events and speak to one another. And what I tend to find is that I'm really drawn to strong female allies. And I often find in the kind of climate emergency um, advocate groups that I'm in, women can often outnumber men in the room and often are in the positions of leadership in the room. And that's something that I personally am really um, finding that I benefit from an awful lot, having kind of strong female role models, people like, you know, Clara Badmore george Maria Smith, um, Julia Barfield, I I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoy and thrive on having people to ask questions and look up to and um, collaborate with in that regard. Um, but I think something that I am feeling more conscious of in the last few weeks is that I really want to be a better ally myself um, and make sure um, to be more inclusive in the work that I do. Um, and in, in order to do that, I guess we're all having a moment of reflection at the moment in terms of are we welcoming everyone who we should be into the discussion and are we using our platforms to make noise about issues um, and also sometimes deciding when to step, step back and platform others and um, so starting to ask myself um, if I should say yes to things or if I should start to elevate others into those positions and um, reaching out to people that I know and offering support. Um, so that personally is what I'm trying to work on in terms of being a better ally. I can't remember the second part of your question though. <laughs> um, I think maybe, maybe we stick to this for now and um, yeah, Julian, if you want to add something to that. Sorry, sorry, I did it again. Um, I, I have to confess that when I, when I first read, read the question, um, I was thinking a lot more about the, the, um, the connections that we, that we sort of necessarily have to forge uh, also, also on a sort of more institutional, uh, more institutional level um, to actually, um, to actually sort of get to places that sort of, as far as I'm concerned, is sort of outside of architecture schools. That's, that, was, that was sort of outwards from there. Um, and, and recently we're looking for, I'm looking, I, me in particular, um, for, for, um, for c c connections inside um, local governments. And I'm navigating um, this, you know, a strange world of essentially c c comrades uh, who have their hands tied and 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 how how it how it works um yeah i mean it's there 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 are i've 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 had to learn a lot about about how to how to make yourself useful um and maybe and and maybe this is in general a thought about allyship that i think sort of goes back to what i said earlier and it's really sort of recognizing from what position um, from what position you can help and from what position you can ask for help. Um, and, and, and really sort of really trying to resist, dare I say, a, a liberal kind of world, the same, um, and really saying, no, what is my, you know, what is, what is my, what is, what is my place and, and what can I do that, that that hits the hardest, uh, even to help you. Um, yeah. That's great. Um, Sita, do you want to jump yeah, in? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I think my allies are other beings, so living and non-living. And I learned so much from that process. And I think I'm trying to build more kinships between living and non-living beings and 
for me, they should be our allies full stop, um, regardless of, well, trying to at least forge allies with them. Um, because I think we, ultimately what we need to be doing is having conversations outside of our disciplines. So designers having conversations outside of design, like the designer conversation. So designers shouldn't be speaking to other designers all the time. And architects shouldn't be speaking to other architects all the time. Like we shouldn't be having these sorts of echo chambers um, all the time. I think there's, there's this idea of circular conversations constantly being, sorry, um, constantly being, well, they're revolving, aren't they? They're not really shifting anything because we're all hearing the same things. How do we actually do something about it rather than listen or rather than think? Or There's just so much that we can do collectively if we find ourselves in a position where we can form shared values with others and that can be within our own disciplines or outside of our disciplines. And I think more and more that needs to happen. And that can, that is a shared narrative, not just in the UK, it can also happen across other cultures as well. That's something that's a really big part of my practice is exploring how others do things or experience things or how others live. And I think, most of my learnings have actually come from that. So sadly, I've not obviously been able to travel for the last three months, but I think there's so much within this idea of sharing values through different cultures as well to form allyships. And I think if any moment in time, we need to be doing that more so than ever. So not just in our own circles, but beyond that as well. So I'm, because I'm a bit of a conduit, um, well, a translator, should I say, I think a lot of what I do is about translating a lot of this knowledge or information somehow to others. And um, I don't call myself a designer anymore, uh, which is quite intentional. And because I have to work with lots of other cultures and lots of other people, from other cultures and countries, and they can be of varying ages as well. So being a translator, I, I can actually disseminate some of this a lot more easily rather than using terminology that's actually uh, quite far removed from like everyday language. So I think there's something about being able to have a relatable way of speaking with one another, almost be, I think we're kind of illiterate right now. And I think that the idea of literacy or language, I think is a really important one to be having. And I think those barriers need to somehow sort of drop a lot more, not to reduce it. I'm not saying that it needs to be reductive in any sort of sense, but it needs to be a relatable one so that more people can be part of the conversation. And it's less of a, an echo chamber. And more people can not only be part of the conversation, but they can actually start sharing the responsibility as well. Um, so my role is very much about like bringing people outside of the industry into the conversation. So we're starting to get some questions from the audience and some of them are quite related to what you're just saying. So I will just, um, Pass it over to Deep to facilitate that bit. Uh, yes, we've got a really good question from the architecture design fashion team. Um, if you are there, I'm going to unmute you. And if you could pose the question yourself, that would be great. You're unmuted now. Oh, hi. Sorry, it's Pavinda from the ADF team at British Council. Um, hey, guys, thanks. Uh, not really nice conversation. Yeah, so my question is, how connected do you feel to voices from the global north and south who experience climate issues quite severely? And does it influence your work and, and how? Thanks. Okay, maybe I'll answer this one. Hey, Parinda, um, nice to see you. Um, yes, I think my work definitely spans across the global north and global south and 
in terms of, I guess, climate issues, um, I actually learn a lot more from others in terms, like learning from the global south is actually really informed how I work in the global north. I think this idea of, um, I guess, framing things in a way where it's very sort of colonial, should I say, has been a real issue. I think in terms of like, there's only a universal way of doing something or there's a dominant way of doing something. And I think learning from others from the global south has actually informed the way in which I've shaped language, the way in which I've shaped uh, my practice even. Uh, being of Asian origin as well, I think, what well, South Asian origin, I think in my own culture, um, I can't run away from it. It's part of me and I've learned a lot so much. I've learned like my values have really shaped me from my own culture, but also uh, this idea of labeling things like sustainability or circular design or circular economy. A lot of these terms are very sort of present in say Europe, UK or global north should I say. And that doesn't really translate across um, global south sort of regions very easily because a lot of it is embodied or it's intuitive. And I think that is a really big divide somehow, but I don't think we should be using one term to describe everything or a universal language to describe things. I think there should be multiple translations in order to learn from one another. There's this idea of an embodied intelligence, a material intelligence, and you know, so many different types of intelligences. Why should we only just result to one? And we should result in, like the written language or the verbal language aren't the only ways of expressing things, basically. And a lot of Global South countries it's so much more about the immaterial than it is about the material. Well, they're actually joined together, to be honest. They coexist more than anything. So it's not, it's about not sort of having this universalism or dominant sort of viewpoint on how we should or could do things. I think it's about sharing this and learning from one another. And there's, again, it comes back to translating and sharing basically. Um, I just want to pick up on something you just said about um, learning from, from sort of how, how um, an approach of decolonizing um, sort of creates these communing, communicating ch chambers between working here and, and working in the global south. We've been with Commonwealth, we've been working on a, on, on a project about cannabis legalization. Um, and the researcher we've been working with uh, makes these really very lucid connections about the, the way the war on drugs has affected um, people here. Uh, black and brown communities here and in the US and how that is mirrored um, on a global scale with the black market. Um, so making, making that kind of argument very clear also so sort of we, we've been working on making it a visual um, so sort of really sort of vi 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 visualizing those issues um, as one and the same thing. Um, that's been, I, I mean, I, I, I sort of keep, keep learning from abolitionists and um, post-colonial theories that think about issues, um, issues that are around the corner. So it's, um... Yeah, I guess I'd really echo that 
as well in terms of um, I think we've got an awful lot to learn um, from cultures who are on the front line essentially of the climate emergency um, both in terms of how they're responding to it as a kind of um, quick response now in terms of mitigation and adaptation but also just a long history of um, being in climates that are different than our own um, and I think in terms of um, advocacy work um, I haven't yet had an opportunity particularly to work closely with um, Global South um, advocates but I think there's going to be more opportunity to over the next year or so. Um, Architects de Care have expanded um, internationally now um, and have for example a South African um, Architects de Cares and I'd really hope that more um, diverse countries would, um, would declare their climate emergency and what's really interesting is seeing the kind of bespoke language that um, each country is adapting the declaration um, to make it more uh, kind of reflective of their own issues that they have. Um, for example, Australia um, adapted some of the text to acknowledge um, uh, the kind of the history that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have um, always espoused the kinds of behaviours that now we're saying are the right behaviours to have and acknowledging that um, that we should be mindful of, like you've said, Sita, um, of language and, and so on as we move to a more kind of international um, platform. Um, and definitely on a personal level, it's something that I'm endeavouring to learn more about and work harder to be more connected to. Um, and in my work as well, I've had opportunity to work on a project in um, South America um, and that's been really fascinating because obviously the, the climate is so different to here that it makes you go back to first principles like being back in architecture school of how, how do I approach design in this climate and you start to realise that actually we ought to approach every project with that kind of mindset because our temperatures are going to change, our climate's going to change, our geography is going to change. Um, and we can't really rely on our kind of lived experience here in London or wherever it is that we're designing and um, to assume that that's how things are going to be in the next 50 years. Um, so yeah, I completely echo that I think we need to um, share knowledge more globally and draw on expertise of those who are kind of really facing the challenges, but also help those people to, um, to if we can because they're facing the kind of consequence of all of our collective actions. And it's a shame that they're having to face kind of disproportionate impacts on their communities um, undeservedly. Thanks all to the panel for those really, really lovely responses. And thank you for the question. Um, got another really good question from Elizabeth Gray. And I'm just gonna unmute you now so you could read it out. You have the mic, Elizabeth. <coughs> Oh, sorry. I, th I thought you would ask the question for me. Um, um, oh, I can ask the question for you. If you prefer. <laughs> no, hello, hello, hello everyone. I, as I said, I'm finding this really inspirational right now. Um, uh, I'm a lecturer in architecture at Newcastle University. I worked in practice for many years uh, in New York, um, originally studied at Yale um, and studied with Keller Easterling. Um, I don't know if you have come across her work. So yeah. I just, I guess, I wondered how you felt about her work in terms of, you know, being kind of, I mean, I don't know if you're millennials. <laughs> I'm a millennial. I was born in 1981. You know, you're younger than I am. Um, but just how you feel about polemical approaches in architecture and I guess the difference from the 68ers and the Gen X. Um, maybe I could just, just a couple words about Keller Easterling. Um, I've been having a lot of conversations about Keller Easterling recently, um, just when discussing infrastructure and and particularly uh, the standards um, and how and how you can use and how you can sort of really weaponize standards to um, to sort of pull different actors into a single um, in infrastructure and sort of get them to move along the channels that you need them to move along. And I think when, when we're thinking about sort of large, um, 
large interventions like the Green New Deal, uh, we need to be thinking at the scales that Keller Easterling is, is, um, is thinking of. Um, and about architecture education, I don't know if, if it's, I don't know if this, if this, um, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe you'll have to expand on that a little bit. I don't know, maybe, maybe if anyone else uh, would, would like to re respond, and I don't know if anyone knows what I mean by polemical. Maybe you could expand on that actually in terms of the context. I've, I've been really struggling with this right now. I mean, I, I came from a very diverse um, community in Florida. Um, my mother's also German. Um, I have Jewish and Latvian heritage. Um, and I invited a good friend of mine to, uh, who works in London and another good friend who works at Zaha Hadid to come review my students work, uh, which is very polemical. It's very theoretical approach, I guess, in architecture in, in the MARC uh, at Newcastle. And one of my students, a very sweet but well-meaning British student, um, said the word segregating her protagonists, which was a trigger. Um, and I have been trying very cautiously to explain and have it be a teaching moment. <laughs> um, <laughs> And it's just very, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to know where the line is. And I don't want to tell anyone how to think or how to design. I just, my role as a teacher is, is to introduce ideas and varying approaches and for the students to really decide for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. I think, well, the polemical is one way of like, expressing something, but it's not the only way. So I am also a tutor at the Royal College of Art and I, I get my students to actually explore, express themselves with their practice through lots of different mediums and it doesn't have to just be verbally or, or like they don't have to write or verbalize it. I think there's so many ways of expressing their ideas or their thoughts or their process. So I mean, textiles is obviously quite a, a rigorous sort of making practice, but there's also a theoretical side to it as well that supports, the, well, has to sort of validate the work in an institution. So I, I get them to kind of explore it through sound, like how will the material sound? How can you start to express a piece of material through, um, its density even um, and that can be through sound or it could be through um, how might it actually talk you know what would it be saying like how to humanize some of these materials so that it can actually have its own voice outside of you as the practitioner and that can be done through film it can be done through photography and um, imagery drawing diagrams there's not there's just so many ways in which um, one can express themselves outside of verbal and written um, means. And I know that may go against a lot of sort of academic um, principles, but I think they should be equally as valid, in t especially if you're doing tutorials or crits or, you know, um, juries and things like this. I don't think you have to explain yourself through just verbal or just through a written format and absolutely. yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and i'm so glad you mentioned acoustics uh i used to be a violinist um professional violinist and i switched to architecture um because i found it actually less competitive um but that's yeah that's another uh thing but um i do teach uh another course that focuses on uh, cultural memory in Vienna versus Berlin um, and how cultural memory in Vienna is repressed. Uh, Schoenberg, you know, doesn't have, uh, you know, <laughs> monuments and there's, you know, the Mozart and the first Viennese school that's really um, prioritized. And then I also really um, kind of push acoustics as a design 
driver in, in that course. So I, yeah, I, I would love to connect with you more and get you in for a crit maybe. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty awesome. I mean, I had a student this week actually who, um, we had exam final exams this week for the master's students in textiles and one student, she's from like a really remote province in China. It's really inland and she's been working with handicrafts uh, mainly ceramic actually even during the lockdown period so she's had no access to a kiln nothing but yet she's produced these hyper detailed ceramics and highly skilled ceramics and she's a textile designer imagine i have no idea how she's done this but it's incredible um like all hats off to her but basically what we discovered through our internal moderator who's been researching handicrafts in China through, well, especially framed on ceramics. So he's been sort of researching that the past six months and he was saying, well, actually her practice is, there's no sort of terminology around it in China. So imagine not having a language to describe what you're expressing or what you're exploring, but she's done it anyway. And because there isn't a language, she's finding it very difficult to communicate what she's doing. So why can't we start to think about like how else can she express her practice and her final presentation or her project? And so she made this really incredible video of her process, which actually expressed it in such a poetic way, even though she can't verbalize it. So I think we need to definitely take into consideration like these different cultural nuances, especially in institutions where I would say perhaps the majority is international, actually. So that needs to be a really big consideration in terms of how we uh, provide sort of tools for, for these learning spaces. I don't like the like I don't like the word teaching at all. So. Um, it's too domineering and it's too hierarchical because I learn as much from the students as they learn from me or vice versa. So I think, yeah, we just need to reframe it entirely, I think. Thanks a lot for, for that really good question. I'm glad we've actually started to connect people, which is one of the things we really wanted to start doing with these series. Um, probably final question and then we'll just wrap up. We've got a, We've got eight minutes before we got to wrap up for the next talk and then I'll finish off with just giving a little intro to the next um, talk that we've got coming up next week. So I think the final question asked by Hannah, um, if you're still here, Hannah, I'm going to unmute you and then we can get you are, you've got the mic, Hannah. Hi guys. Hello everyone. It is lovely to hear from you. It's really cool listening to all of you speak. Very inspiring. Uh, my question was, I was just thinking about earlier when you were talking about codes of conduct for architects. And I wondered if you could sort of wave a magic wand and add anything to the end of code of conduct for architects. Not, it doesn't have to be a realistic that, that our ARB would actually take on what you would love to see architects automatically sign up to. Because it sounds like a lot of the stuff you have to kind of decide to be part of instead of something that automatically happens as qualifying as an architect. So yeah, I was wondering what you think. Well, I guess to contextualise that at the moment, standard five, I've Googled because I saw your question, um, <laughs> to get the right wording. Currently, the only um, wording around this, I suppose, is where appropriate, you should advise your client on how best to conserve and enhance the quality of the environment and its natural resources. So there's actually no um, real commitment there to anything to do with the environment. It's just where appropriate you should advise and it's really, really weak wording. Um, so I guess an easy cop out answer to this would be that I would suggest that um, standard five should be re redrafted um, and that it should um, completely incorporate probably the ACAN um, commitments instead, the kind of ACAN um, themes and their kind of um, wording, or it should adopt the architects of care wording because already we've got almost a thousand practices signed up to that. So it seems like people are on board with it. Why not just slot it in and make it compulsory for all of us? And instead of using language like where appropriate, mm -hmm. um, maybe, maybe 
be a bit harder on us now because I think we're at the point where where appropriate you should advise just isn't good enough anymore um, and until this is changed the architect really under kind of um, any kind of legal framework doesn't really have a leg to stand on apart from trying their best to um, talk to clients, trying their best to um, do things. So I think until this is mandated by the ARB, it's, it's not strong enough. Um, but thou shalt not engage in any social cleansing of any kind, I think would, would um, maybe re, reworded, but any, any form of regeneration um uh that is uh that is destroying that is thought to be damaging or undermining a community particularly of color should um that should be in in the in the ethical code very very high up thank you thanks a lot everyone um actually can we hear a last a code of conduct thing from sita especially as someone who's not in a practicing architect. <laughs> I knew you were no, going to say um, Okay, so I can't really speak from an architect's perspective in terms of like the codes of conduct that are placed in REBA standards and things like this. But I think, oh, I have so much to say about codes of conduct, sorry. It's just too much because I think it's just implying that there's only one way of doing something and there's only one um, voice in this. And that is kind of problematic, I think, because then everything ends up looking the same. It comes, becomes really generic and less biodiverse. Um, and I think there are different types of conduct, I think, that need to be taken into consideration, whether it's um, soil or whether it's um, like protection or pre preservation or conservation or um, durability. Like there's so many different types of systems that we can work with and against, actually. So I think we need to think about like tem different temporalities, for example. Um, for me, I have this sort of, well, it's not a theory, it is a fact. Like everything has an end of life uh, at some point. So we need to take that into consideration as a code of conduct, I think, and understand what um, I guess the use is in terms of its lifespan, its life. So almost thinking of the birth, the life, the death and the rebirth of something as part of a code of conduct, just as human beings. And I think a building has a life of its own, materials have a life of its own and the surroundings has a life of its own. So I think a lot of this should be somehow brought into the framework of a code of conduct and thinking about different temporalities, different systems that actually support those di different temporalities, which then means the materials that you end up uh, placing in those situations or those places um, become more meaningful, actually, and actually aid that process and makes it less harmful. And because ultimately that's what we want is for things to be less harmful or not harmful at all. Thank you. Thank you, Sita. And thanks everyone else for participating today. Um, I've kind of had a question, but it's going to more turn into a statement because we don't really have time, <laughs> time unfortunately. But I think all, all of you here today are doing some really fantastic research in areas you're so really passionate about, uh, trying to affect the change in a number of ways. And it's been really inspirational to hear you talk about your work directly. Cat, particularly the things you've been doing with Letty, uh, um, I think you and your team, the work you've been doing is quite game changing. And I know where I'm working right now as an in-house architect for a local authority, we're beginning to incorporate the guidance in the Letty guide directly into our brief for the next huge batch. And I actually want to, we're trying to work on the next uh, sort of the prime, I forgot the, the word you use for it, but it's a word for the kind of super prime zero carbon like uh, project that could follow all of the Letty guidelines. So 
I think you must recognize all of you, the, the weight and the power of your research, especially as large organizations see its value and start embedding it as well as um, educational institutes. So I think, I think carry on what you're doing. It's really good. Uh, and I'm sure um, that is part of your goal, but it must be quite, uh, must feel quite heavy in that sense as well that people are really adopting this. Um, so thanks a lot, everyone. And thanks for uh, all, the, all our speakers.